So, um, Jay Jacobs, you know him from many places. He's our local celebrity. He's our podcast host for the Risk Science Podcast. And any of you who haven't checked that out, risksciencenet it is hilarious. And I really wish I had the sound clip for that one where one of his podcast co-hosts is Alex Hutton. You've heard his name mentioned a couple of times. And he did this thing. It was like a Sunday, Sunday, Sunday kind of version of for Syracon, Thursday, 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 Doug Hubbard. It was really great. Doug Hubbard actually linked up to it on, on his website because he thought it was so awesome. So um, check out the podcast. Jay Jacobs is also an author of, tell the title of the book, please, Jay. Uh, Data-Driven Security. Thank you. And it has a lot of pictures, right? Because it's visualization a lot too, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so it's really cool. And, um, and the other thing that is, Jay is famous for is that he is one of the authors of the Verizon DBIR, which is a really cool document. Everyone in here has seen it, I'm sure. But if you haven't, check out the DBIR. It's a huge piece of work. And this year, it got even way better than all the other years. They made like a quantum leap forward in their like, uh, things they figured out from all the data they looked at. So check it out. But Jay, finally, um, Jay was one of the original founders of CIRA. And he, he started it. He's the vice president of our board. And we literally would not be here if it weren't for Jay. So, and Alex. And Alex. And, 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 and Alex. And if you have, but you're, I said one of. Yes. One of. Yes, one so of. without you, that would be it. So thank you for that, Jay. Thank you for creating, helping create this organization. And thanks for being our capstone of this experience. So take it away, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we should also spend some time and thank Lisa for doing all the work on this. <laughs> An unbelievable amount of effort from her part. So, This conference actually made me think of, and, and this is uh, going to show my true geeky colors right away, but it made me think of uh, elliptical curve cryptography. <laughs> and there's a connection here. There's a connection. So elliptical curve cryptography was invented by two people. Uh, in 1985, and the interesting thing about the two people is that they did not work together. Okay? They, they both independently developed elliptical curve cryptography. So if you look up who developed elliptical curve cryptography, two people are listed and they're independent. And why, why this conference made me think of that is that there are so many ideas here that are similar. There's a lot of these ideas that everybody is sort of percolating on and everybody's thinking on. And everyone's kind of making little inroads here and there. And then I went out and looked, and, and there are multiple discoveries that have uh, more than one person working on it at the same time. And I found out that like um, Einstein's theory of relativity had three other people that had discovered it right around the same time. And it was Einstein, though, who put the famous formula to it. And he's uh, attributed to discovering it. Um, so that, that's, it just, it amazed me how much of the same theme and same things that, that we're all talking about. And this is uh, going to continue that. Um, I, I had finished my slides long before the conference, uh, but it's really cool that what I'm going to talk about is along those lines. So to start out, I have a, I have a question, and it's a, a kind of piggybacking off of Michael Reutemann's talk. How many people actually know the difference, and be honest, between a log normal and Pareto distribution. <laughs> Fantastic, a lot of hands stay down. That's my audience. You guys in the back, just screw you guys, okay? <laughs> All right, so I have an evolution to my career. And I started out as a network uh, admin, sysadmin, that sort of thing. I was doing pen testing back before that was a term, back in the 90s. And it was a very, very difficult thing to sell to a company. Um, and I, I moved into cryptography. And I mentioned elliptical curve cryptography. But I was really excited because cryptography offered like, the, the most sexiest uh, uh, solution to security. Right? We can encrypt data. We can, we can put it through the hands of our adversary. And it's safe. Right? But I quickly discovered that that didn't matter that uh, it's all about the key management. Uh, what do you do with the keys? How are they generated? <laughs> Things like that. And so uh, it got me interested in risk analysis. So if we encrypt the data, what do we do with the key? Do we put it on the, the hard drive? Um, and if we do that, do we password protect it? And if we password protect it, do we uh, put that in a config file? Where does that go, right? So it all went down to risk, risk analysis, risk management. 
And that got me really interested in that. And I started studying and reading about risk analysis, and it was thoroughly depressing. It was, and, and I focused on IT risk. Remember Jack on the panel yesterday said that he did the same thing. He started focusing on IT risk and quickly realized not to study IT risk, right? And same thing with me. I looked at IT risk. I read ISO and NIST and all these things, and I'm like, God, these really seem like they suck. What else is out there? What else is there, right? And that led me to this wonderful field of statistics. And I wrote data science up there. That's the latest, latest term for statistics. And I'm going to talk about that evolution of the terminology there. But, um, and so this, this transition in, into data science, though, I went back to school. Uh, and I went to in a master's program for applied statistics. I really wanted to learn it. And I found it challenging to just jump in cold. And so I went back to school, and I found a couple of things. First, schools are not just behind in teaching information security. Um, I was studying uh, statistics, and I learned a technique, and I, w I joined um, local groups around here, our user group, things like that, where statisticians hang out. And someone was talking about a technique. And they were, they were t going through these different techniques. And I had just learned some attribute of it, like the night before in the class. And I raised my hand. I'm like, hey, you didn't talk about this one technique. Uh, and the guy was like, nobody does that. It's like 20 years old. Nobody does that anymore. We all do this and this and this. And I was really embarrassed because I had just learned it the night before. So I quickly realized that uh, they were behind the times. And, and statistics is often now very tied to tool sets. And we're using technology that was easily 15 years old right, in class and stuff like that. It was very frustrating for me. And I realized that I could get a much better education in statistics you know, with the same amount of money in books from Amazon than I could in class. And the class actually really helped me learn the, the figures and, and how to read papers and things like that. And then that led to this book, Data Driven Security. I wrote it with Bob Brutus, uh, another person on the board uh, who couldn't make it here. But I want to read a passage um, from the book, a dramatic reading, if you will. <laughs> but it, it, it talks about the, the, the thrill and the joy of working with data. And I know that we've talked a lot about this conference about working with data, that we struggle, um, we struggle to get data, we, we struggle to make meaning of it and stuff like that. Um, and, and to be honest, in the last three, four years, I have not been working in risk management. I've been working in uh, statistics and data analysis on the DBIR. So this is what I want to read, though. Working with data can at times be a little bit like an archaeological dig, spending hour after hour with small tools in the hope of uncovering even the tiniest of insights. So it is with data analysis. Pearls of wisdom are nestled deep within data just waiting to be discovered and presented to an eagerly awaiting audience. It is only with that sense of wonder and curiosity that the hours spent cleaning and preparing data are not just tolerable, but somehow exciting and worth every moment. Because there is that moment when you're able to turn a light on an otherwise dark room, when you can describe some phenomenon or explain some pattern when it all becomes worth it. That's what you're after. You're uncovering those tiny moments of enlightenment hidden in plain sight if you know where to look. And <laughs> but that, that really is what, what it's about. It's about getting in there. If you have a problem, find the data. Look at what the data is saying. The data is just another term for what you're observing. Right? What are you observing? What's going on in the environment? And this is, this is a moment that I had. This is from the DBIR. This is figure 19. And I had spent months actually working on the top portion of this, the patterns across the top. And I, I was, I was kind of like Lisa for this conference, where she would go and nag all the people to speak and stuff like that. I was doing that with um, professors and statisticians and stuff. I would sit down and I'd buy them lunch, and I'd be like, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. Does this make sense? And running all the stuff by them. And I got this pattern, the patterns in the data, the patterns of attacks, if you will. These are different types of breaches and, and security incidents that companies are experiencing. And then I had an idea, and it was late in the night, and I decided to split it out across industries. And that's what's on the left here is the industries. And you can see the, the pattern that comes out here. There is, no, there is no everybody should do one thing, right? Um, and when this came out of my screen, again, I'm going to show my geek colors a little bit, I teared up. 
I'm dead serious. I mean, this was like, no one has seen this before. And then I had another thought that I've got to share this with at least my boss. Because if I go, and I was working in my basement, if I go up to bed and a meteor hits my house, <laughs> this will be lost forever, right? So, and I, I could spend a lot of time talking on this, but um, the point of my talk and, and the point, I, what I really wanted to do with this talk is go back to my earlier self and say, what would I need, what would I want to know? What would I want myself to know then that would save a whole lot of effort in trying to pursue risk analysis? And this is the little nugget that I want to share. Risk analysis is just data analysis. We can solve so many problems if we frame it like this. Now, this is an oversimplification. I'll, I'll give you that. But if we think of risk analysis as just data analysis, do we want to attack it with a uh, high, medium, low grid three by three? Right? And here's the first thing I want, to, I want to do to support that. I labeled this risk analysis in the upper right. But really, this is from the book. This is, we called it the data science workflow. This is how people work with data. But let's talk about the same thing in terms of risk analysis. When you do a risk analysis, you want to, you want to start with a question. What are you analyzing? What are you trying to solve? When people research anything, they want to start with a research question. Right? You, do, you do your PhD thesis. You do anything like that. You start with a question. The question frames the problem. What am I researching? What am I trying to analyze? What kind of risk or, or thing am I trying to measure? What kind of a decision am I going to help by answering this question. And then to, to, to answer that question, you need to go get data. You need to gather observations, right? You need to go out and look at your systems, try and figure out what you need to answer that question. Then there's a stage of, of cleaning and transforming the data, making sure that your data, data you have is accurate. Then you perform the data analyses. And that is in the middle of this whole flow. You want to examine the output. Looking at the output, you may decide, hey, that data I grabbed was really garbage, or the model I'm, I'm using is inefficient, or not the right model. And you get this cycle going back. Once you get a valid output, you want to present it. You can talk about data visualization and dashboards and how to communicate effectively. But this is the overall flow, right? This is risk analysis, right? Anybody think there's something different? That goes on. I mean, you can add a lot of color. You can add a lot more boxes and arrows and stuff like that, make it a lot more complex. But this is basically it. Start with a question, get something to support it, figure out what that means, and then present it. So if we assume that's true, that we're just really talking about data analysis, let's look at that. And let's go back in history, because learning about history is one of the best things that you can do to understand where we've been and where we might go in the future. So I'm going to go back to 1850, 1850s. And uh, in London, there was uh, several cholera outbreaks. And this is the first really great example of data analysis. Uh, these two physicians, these are two phys physicians, said to be the, the birth of epidemiology. They were trying to study um, this epidemic of cholera. And uh, they were in a heated debate. The man on the right, John Snow, created this famous visualization. Anybody who looks into visualization knows this map. And this map is like the smallest part of this story, to be honest. But it's, it's a very famous map, because he created this by hand. He went and, and recorded the deaths from cholera, made little tick marks at the address. And he realized that they were clustering around this pump on Broad Street. And his conclusion was that there's something wrong with that pump. And here's an updated picture, because it's a lot easier to see. You can see the pump in the middle, and everything sort of clustering around it. So he petitioned the city to have the, the pump handle removed. Pump handle was removed, and the, and the epidemic subsided. This did not kill the argument. This was not, the debate did not stop. Right? A few years before, the other man, William Farr, published a report on the epidemic in 1849, a few years earlier. And he produced this data. And this is literally the data from the paper. This is what he published. And he did a few basic descriptive things, like an average uh, mean. But he pointed at this data and said, look at this data, this table, just like this. Look at this table. The, the, the outcome is obvious. It's an airborne problem. Right? That's what he did. He pointed at this table and said, obviously, it's an airborne 
illness. Researchers went back to his table and said, if modern techniques had been available, it would have changed his conclusion. They did not know what caused cholera until the bacteria was discovered 25, 30 years later. So that map from Jon Snow, everything like that. And I think this is largely where we are, right? We go out and we get things and we put them in and we say, look, of course, this is a medium, right? <laughs> so but let's keep going in, in the history. So we, we fast forward to the 1920s. Uh, Ronald Fisher. Um, and Doug Hubbard said something this morning. He said, um, science, I think he said, science is uh, not just about having data, it's about going out and collecting data. And that's one of the things that Fisher discovered. He was brought into a, a research farm, farmstead north of London that they had collected 90 years worth of data on fertilizer. And they captured things like the number of days of sun, number of days of rain, which field, what fertilizer they got, and then the yield, the crop yield that they got from that field. And they gave him 90 years worth of data, you know, clunk, and said, please make sense of this. Tell us what makes our good fertilizer. And he looked at it and realized that the way they had collected their data made analysis difficult. And in some, some cases, uh, uh, couldn't do it. So he started designing this, the design of experiments, he called it. And you cannot bring a, a drug to market or a medical device to market without using some of these techniques. Right? Him and his peers developed during this time. What, what him and his peers developed uh, has revolutionized science in the 20th century, except maybe for computer science. But, um, but the other thing is that during this time, there was a split. There was mathematics, which was a pure theoretical, wonderful world of mathematics. And people like Fisher were now soiling that by doing real things, right? Working with real data. And there was this rift, and they called them applied mathematicians, right? And uh, there was this rift, and, and the applied mathematicians would be like, you guys are way too much theory, and the theory guys would be saying, you guys are just playing in the mud, you know? Um, but let's fast forward. That's an important point, we'll fast forward. As the computer started to evolve, Largely, people did what you would expect. They did the same old techniques that they were doing with pencil and paper uh, and brought it onto the computer, and it went faster. But others started looking at the computer as more of a tool. This is John Tukey, and he was a, a famous statistician by himself, very talented in stats, multiple techniques developed uh, under his name. But he realized that the computer could do more, and that the computer not only did more, but it also in, in started creating more data. Right? But he developed a technique called exploratory data analysis. A lot of the basic visualization techniques came out of Tukey and during this period. Uh, the box plot, things like that. And, um, but he's the first one that said, let's stop doing this classic statistics. Let's start looking at data in a new way. Let's see what we can make computers do to help us with this data. And we started to get this other divide now. Right? And it, it came to a head with a paper recently by Leo Brayman in 2001, where he talked about the two cultures of statistical modeling. And in a sense, he described another fracture. We had mathematics and then the applied mathematics, which became known as statistics. And now we've got statistics and this other world known as data science. And it's all the same thing. I mean, everyone's doing all the same math, roughly speaking. But now what we have for data science is that you have to program. It takes programming languages to do data science. That's the, that's the theory, right? But statisticians are programming as well, you know, but you're having that same argument now between statisticians and data scientists. Data scientists are saying, you guys are far too theoretical, right? And the, theoret the statisticians are like, why are you guys doing all that crazy computer stuff? I mean, you got all these great models, you know? But what this paper talked about is the classical mode of solving this problem of observables X on the right side here um, we observe a bunch of X's, what happens that causes an outcome? And in the classic mode, they talked about, we define what's in that black box. It's a linear model, it's a logistic, it's a Cox model, whatever it is. We'll, we're gonna define that. The new culture, the, the data science, the al algorithmic folks said, we have no idea what's in that black box, but we can approximate it, right? We, can, we have no idea what's in there, but we can say, if given all these inputs, we can recreate these outputs, right? So you get things like um, decision trees, random forests, neural nets. 
and largely what, what data science is now. So I want to point to this and talk about what data science is not and the common misconception of what statistics, data science, what all that stuff actually means. People think that it's like a big, giant, complex calculator. And if you go to school and you study this, you face a problem, you put the data in, punch some stuff, and you get the answer, right? That is absolutely not what this is. And this is, this is portraying that. You start on that orange square, and the first one says, do you have more than 50 samples? Right? I wish Hubbard stuck around to see this, because he might enjoy it. If you don't have more than 50 samples, go get more data, right? And this is absurd. This is absolutely absurd. And the other thing, you know, it just goes through and it says, it's all these yes, no, right? You go through here and once you get to the end, hey, you're solved. And the other thing, like they have a few models that they list, like up in the classifiers here, SGD and linear, and like there's a, a package I'm working with, has 169 models in this one package that it wraps. And which model are you supposed to use? The one that works the best. Right? Not the one that something said, you work the, the one that works the best. And so this is really what data science is. Much simpler. You start, you try something, you see if it's helpful. If it's not helpful, try something else. Right? There's this debate on, on you know, like risk analysis, is it more art or science? I think anybody who asks that has neither studied art nor science. Because I know I, I studied music. The first time I went to school, uh, I studied music, and the first two years of music school was music theory, right? Here are all the rules of music, all the science of music. And you get into science, and like, all right, here are all the rules of science, now go break them, right? That's what it's all about, learning the rules and the creativity. But this part is really helpful, right? Focusing on this, is it helpful? This part is so incredibly important, right? <laughs> We need to focus on this. This is essential. Now, I wanted to think back to what we do in information security, right? This is, I think, this is my model of what happens in InfoSec, right? We try something, and the criteria if we keep it is, does somebody complain, right? Hey, I built a model, and then if you hear sounds, you're like, cool, put that in production, you know? Um, but let's go back to Something, I actually threw this in late because I was preparing for the panel last night and I came across this and I cited it to Doug and I asked him if something had changed, right? But that first one, right? Three reasons that risk management fails. The failure to measure and validate methods as a whole or in part. That question, is this helpful? Hey, I modeled something. Is, is it valid? Does it work? Is it helpful? Am I going to make a better decision with it? And that seems like a great thing to talk about in theory but the great thing is, statistics has focused on it for 150 years now. Trying to solve that basic one problem. Hey, when I look at the data, when I look and observe the world around me, how can I effectively learn from that? And this, I think, um, puts faces literally to the names. Right? If you think about all of these people on this slide, their entire career was spent working with observations, trying to learn. Right? I've got Fisher in the upper right, and then Jersey Nyman right next to him. These two guys hated each other, and I put them next to each other just for the irony. And then you've got George Box, right? He said, uh, all, all models are wrong, some are useful. Right? Next to Gertrude Cox, the Box-Cox uh, approach to, and John Tukey down here, right? And um, box cox is an actual thing, like there's an approach, a transformation called the box cox transformation. Um, but the real fun terminology gets into machine learning with Leo Brayman and stuff, when you actually grow a random forest and prune the trees in the forest and stuff like that. These are valid things that people will teach, you know. So. And so, and this is where I've spent the last three years of my life. And then I went back to something like this. I was like, what the hell is this? And I, I've done this, and I, maybe you guys have seen stuff like this, right? But this has nothing, nothing to do with these people, right? So I want to get into a little bit of how this happens. And you saw it in the, in the thing with Leo Brayman. You have some amount of observables, right? You observe this and you record that data, 
That data then, you want to do something to it. Try to understand how that data interacts to have an outcome. Right? The outcome is somehow related to the observations. You know it. Right? People do, Jack, you were talking about the bits, bits assessment, right? Thousands of questions. Somehow those observations help with the outcome of how much risk they have, right? Somehow, that's the model, right? And this is what we challenge. And there's two reasons to do this, two reasons to model this. One, you can make predictions or forecasts or whatever about the future, right? You can help, if you observe the stuff on the left, you can predict the stuff on the right, hopefully before it happens. Right? The other reason is that you may learn and discover about the system itself. Which of these on the left, if we can affect these on the left, what can we affect on the right? What, what, could, we, what could we mitigate on the left to improve our risk on the right? So here's, uh, here's a scenario I want to run through. Bob Rudis is not here, but I'm going to talk about his army of minions. So theoretically, Bob is building an army of minions and needs to build transport pods for them but he can't let his minions know that he's gonna jettison them into outer space. So how, how is he gonna measure them? Now Bob is incredibly resourceful, one of, one of the smartest guys I've worked with, and he uh, obviously has access to their home. You don't wanna ask why, but he does. <laughs> so what could he measure in their home to determine height, weight, how, how big to build these pods? Right? That's what the problem we're describing. Right? Maybe he could measure shoe size, pant length, Things about their clothes, their uh, chairs, their bed, I don't know, whatever, whatever you can get, you could measure, right? How is that gonna translate into the pod size? Now, if you haven't ever studied this before, you may think this is what it is, right? There's some kind of magic, right? And let's look at what we do in IT risk. Generally speaking, we start out with some questions, we give the answer some kind of a score, multiply it by a weight, get some risk, right? We rinse and repeat for the number of questions or something like that. This down here, this is what you're saying is in that black box. You're saying, I understand how the world works, and I'm putting weights to it, and this is what I know is in the black box. Here's an example, binary risk analysis. Came out two years ago, Ben Shapiro. He said, the inputs are 10 yes or no questions, he developed a work card that said, you know, low, low is low here, and low, medium is medium. Uh, that's what's in the black box, and output is a low, medium, high risk. That's the model he developed. Here's another one a lot of people are familiar with, CVSS. You answer questions about CVSS, they have a uh, crazy formula that looks uh, strangely made up that goes into the black box, and you get a CVSS score, right? Here's, here's a good one, Poneman. He can tell you the cost of a breach if you just give him a number of records, right? Doesn't matter what kind of records, how many records, I can tell you, you multiply it by a static number, which changes slightly every year, to get the cost of a breach, right? This is the model. This is what we develop, okay? So here are the challenges, and everybody has faced these challenges. Anybody who's tried to develop a risk model faces these challenges. You're not sure what to collect, you're not sure how they get combined in the black box. Once you combine them, you're not sure how much to trust the output. Seems good, right? And then you're not even sure if all the questions you're asking is useful, right? These are the challenges. Do, does this, do people relate to this as you try to build a risk model? So here's the really cool thing. If this is the challenge, it's largely been answered. Okay, statistics, the, the picture of all those people, that's what they've been working on. Now the, the challenging thing is that there's a lot of people that worked on it, so when you talk about this side, there's literally a dozen names for it. You talk about problems with terminology, right? These are called uh, features in machine learning. In classic statistics, it's independent variables or inputs or uh, different things like that. Then you have a model or an algorithm or something in there and model validation at the end. So all of this is predicated on something that we largely don't have in information security, and that is labeled data, or ground truth, you may hear. So if we go back to Bob's problem here of trying to, to measure his minions, what he needs to do is collect full samples 
In other words, he needs to go out and measure random shoe sizes, pant length, all the things that he wants to measure on people that will tell him, or he can measure, their height and weight. So he wants to get something like this, where he's got multiple samples, and he measures various things and can correlate it to the output. Now, these aren't his minions, right? But this is how statistics work. We need this labeled data. So we need to go out and say, all right, if we've had a breach, let's, let's try to model impact, right? Let's look at our last breach. How much did that cost? We can get, hey, this is what led up to the breach on this side, and then the cost, what did we spend, will be this last column, right? Now we can start to model the next breach. We can model other breaches. If we share this information, we could look at across industries, right? We could do stuff like that. Is this ringing true? So once you get that labeled data, now you can start, you've got that full picture. Now you can try to figure out what's in here. And then you can start to figure out if these are valid, if these are helpful. And then you can also figure out, is this, is this going to help? Is, are these and this going to accurately help us determine that? And this is statistics. This has all been done. This is really exciting for me right, to discover this. So I'm going to walk through an example. Um, what factors contribute to malware? So this is uh, the first thing that Bob Rudis and I ever worked on. Uh, F-Secure did a blog post where they released the latitude and longitude of zero access infected bots. That's all they did, latitude, longitude. So we started playing with it, uh, had a great time. And um, when we were writing the book, we went out and tried to get fresh data. So we got over 800,000 latitude, longitude pairs for the zero access botnet. And this is the uh, distribution across the US by US county. Okay? So this is, you know, the, the brown ones are denser regions. You can kind of see the big cities, a little denser region. Some of the more sparse places are, are green. So if you look at this, what do you think that this maps to? What are some of the things that we should try to collect? Anybody have a guess? What does this look like? Anyone? Popular, right, alien visits. That, that's exactly what we thought too. <laughs> so it's really cool, I didn't get it, that's not on the recording. And people are gonna be like, someone said alien visits? Um, no, but we, I mean, this is for fun, right? So we went out and we gathered all of the alien visits by U.S. County at the National UFO Reporting Center. They, they capture this data, right? And we ran it through just a basic linear regression. And this is the only part I really get into the math a little bit. But this is the output on top, OK? But the, in this output, we answer all of those questions we were just wondering. And the upper right, is the feature useful? Is looking at UFOs useful? And this is a p-value. And, and you, you, there's criticism of p-value, but the p-value here is incredibly small. This is a, a highly, highly contributing factor in this model. Um, and if you have more, you'll see more in the line there. And you can look at each of them and see how they each contribute to the overall model. Then you can look at this 8.3. And what that 8.3 means is that for every UFO visit, you see 8.3 infections of zero access. <laughs> and it's significant, right? <laughs> now, if we go down here, what we see, this is the overall model on the bottom. We see the p-value there is also very small meaning that this is significant, that this model is working, right? The R squared is telling you what proportion of the data is this describing. So this is describing about 75% of the variance across the, the thousand or so uh, US counties. This is a pretty valid model. Now, if, if, there, if we uh, you know, skipped common sense for just a moment, this is publishable, right? The p-value is under 0.05, Therefore, it's publishable, right? It's valid research, right? So, but statistics goes a little bit further, and you can test for something called collinearity with population, as an example. Just pick something at random. And when we account for population in the model, you can see these things are still significant, but if you look at that R squared value, now this is describing 0.4% of our data. This is not helpful, right? Looking at UFO visits, is not helpful when describing malware infections. I know that might be a shock, but just, you know. 
So, but if we, if we go back and look at this, it, you know, we, we took it further and we looked at income, education, number of businesses, number of IP addresses, but it largely was just a function of population. That is not that interesting. That's why you did not see this in any sort of journal. <laughs> so, but the point here, um, to, to kind of talk more about the, the science aspect, when you're facing something like this, there, there is no textbook that says, oh, go, go grab these variables, you'll be great, right? And that's what a lot of people want. People say, tell me what to measure, right? Go tell me what to measure. You know, I have no idea. What we did is we said, maybe it's these things. We don't know. And this is how these models work. You go out and you grab things that may help, right? And then you test them. Is it helpful? Do these work, right? And that's, I mean, that's how everything is structured in statistics. You go out and you grab your variables, make sure that they're collected properly, and you test them. You make sure that they help what you're trying to understand. And so really, that's, that's all I really had here, and I just wanted to make that point. Right? That if we treat risk analysis as a data analysis problem, we will find a wealth of information out there to help us. So if you're wondering how to kickstart your, your risk analysis program within risk management, I didn't talk about risk management as a whole, right? But if you, just along that real quick, if you think of risk management as decision management, it also becomes a lot easier and the Google searches come back a lot more helpful. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so just to wrap up, um, just thinking of it as data analysis um, brings that so, so much easier. And if you're really thinking about how can I kind of kickstart my program, think about hiring a, a statistician. Um, and I know that, like for example, I know there's a few people in the back of the room that did not uh, come up through information security or even IT, for example. Um, can I pick on you guys for a moment? Stuart, what's your background? Neuroscience. Uh, Michael, what's your background? Sorry, what? Game theory? Game theory? Yeah, not a lot of IT in either of those two. But that, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we need more of, right? If you're wondering how to, how to integrate this in your program, go hire a statistician. Go hire a scientist, right? They will have no clue what, what DNS is when they walk through the door, right? No clue. But you can teach them that stuff, right? Or take the people you have who know what DNS is and go send them off to several, any one of the programs out there. Right now, data science is uh, fortunately incredibly popular, and there are a lot of online programs. Even Coursera has several uh, data science, algorithm generation, all of that. So that's all I had. Any questions for me? Stuart. Wait, wait. Wait, wait, oh, wait I need wait, the wait. microphone. Great talk. Um, so one of the challenges that I face as someone trying to do what you're talking about is the lack of ground truth data. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, you say go out and collect these things. I would love to walk into every corporation in America and say, hey, give me all of your breach information. I'm, I'm, I'm right. a good guy, trust me. Yeah. But uh, sometimes collecting the data is hard. So, and this isn't really covered by your talk, but so what are things that we can do to make this data collection problem easier? And are there sort of other signals that we should be collecting um, in addition to the ground truth we need? Great question. So I, I, I think we actually have a bigger problem of people not wanting to share, is that they don't realize the benefit of sharing, right? I, there was a job I had a couple years ago where I, I had this job to look at um, program selection for investing information security funds. And I said, well, man, I'd love to see all the data we have on our, uh, on our tickets, our incident tickets from the, the SOC. And the response I got was, why? We want you to look at the projects, not, not the SOC. We want you to look at what we need to fund. And I'm like, yeah, that's going to tell us, right? And there wasn't that connection. They didn't understand the connection between the data of what's going on and the data of what needs to be done. Right, so I think that's the first problem. But the other problem you mentioned, this lack of ground truth, the lack of the ability to get this data, even in an, in an organization where you don't, you're not sharing it externally, just in the organization, it's a huge challenge, huge challenge. Um, and there's even a, a bigger problem in information security that I won't get into, that difficult to actually trying to things that are valid ground truth, right? But the, the, the big problem is just understanding um, 
that we do need to get this data, right? And that this data is important. I think that's the first battle. So if we start to talk about this, like, you know, if we're going to model impact, for example, people don't even understand that understanding uh, the external legal engagements that happen during a breach is an important part of understanding the impact, that they should be recording that. And they didn't record it last time. I mean, pretty much guaranteed if you try to go in an organization and say, what did you spend on your last breach for this part? They'll say, wow, we didn't record that, right? Then you say, all right, next one, can we record that? Right? And then say, hopefully, you know, I can show you how valuable that is by starting to create some of these models. So I hope that answered the question. Who else? I'm ready. I'm looking. Evan? Thanks. And Ali is gone, and Patrick is gone now. Oh. <laughs> it's unfortunate. So, Jay, if I wanted to ditch CVSS tomorrow, and I've got a volume of all these vulnerabilities coming in, being announced on a daily basis. What is my alternative? So I'm, I'm going to pimp out Michael Reutemann again. Um, he did a talk, uh, where was it, Black Hat? And before that, too, um, talking about the challenges with CVSS. And I mean, the process that he went through, almost anybody could go through if you go out. And the data is um, which CVEs are exploited, right? Which vulnerabilities are exploited? And that's the data that you worked with, right, Michael? And so essentially what you have is the, the observations are which are exploited, and then you have the other data of which do I have. Then you can essentially just kind of do that pairing. And there's other sources, too. There's CVSS. There's, uh, what are the other ones? NVDD. Let me give you he the mic. He needs a microphone. But while he's running, there are other sources, of course, that you can tap into to look at more indication of how severe this is. So Michael, maybe just explain it for a moment. Um, there's NVD, there's Shodan, which gives you Metasploit and ExploitDB, so does the exploit exist? But at the most simple level, CVSS has a vector which has a whole bunch of relevant feature information. It's just that the way that it's combined is a crazy ass formula that doesn't make sense. But if you wanna do some real statistics and real learning about it, create what Jay was just describing in this talk, and see which ones of them are good indicators, see if the model fits, and keep changing that model as you get new data instead of doing it in a static fashion, then you'll do better by default very easily. Yeah, so I hope that helps. I mean, the, the really simple answer is a statistics. You gotta get the vendor to do it. Right, yeah. Some vendors are working on it. Actually, can I, can I make a comment to that? Like. Not to, not to pick on you there, but <laughs> that sort of is like the anti-point of Jay's talk. Like, if we want to be able to handle these risks, we need to understand this as a science. And, um, as, well, as someone who's very passionate about data, um, I kind of cry whenever someone's like, oh, I'll just hire someone to do my data analysis for me. Yeah. And I realize, like, not everyone can be in my shoes, but, like... But, uh, so there's if, two thoughts to that. There's um, what I yeah. call an algorithm in a box. Right? That you, you buy a machine that, that does machine learning and it can do all these things. And, and I, I kid Alex uh, Pinto about it a little bit because I think that's what he's doing. But the point is, like, that type of a thing, it's far better than what we have. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of deficiencies with it. It can get uh, out of tune, it can, you know, not be up with current data and stuff like that, but it's still going to be far better than what we're doing now, right? I think. That's my gut. We'd have to test it. <laughs> Yeah, so, Chris? Yeah, so I just wanted to react momentarily to the, to the comment that we should be doing our own data analysis and coming to our own scientifically, statistically valid conclusions concerning the outcomes and what their contributing factors are and the mechanism underlying it and so forth. Um, on the one hand, I agree, but on the other, if I would try to put myself in your shoes, there are not enough hours in the day to do all that kind yeah. of stuff. And you know, if I had certain symptoms and I knew I didn't feel right and there was something weird going on with me but I didn't know what it was, I wouldn't go to medical school and then fire up a lab and, 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 and figure out that I was gonna die in a week because I didn't catch this two years ago or whatever. I would go to someone who had the expertise who would prick my finger, run it through something and give me a scientifically valid result to tell me you know, what I was facing. And you know, maybe your issue is more like that, your yeah. concern is more like that, and you're the guy who, or you guys, are the folks who went to medical school that we're gonna turn to 
when we need the right answers. Uh, so I think part of that is the scale, right? That it's, it's very difficult for all of the Fortune 1000 to spin up 1,000 groups of data scientists to solve essentially what could be the very similar issue. So I think we, we could scale, and obviously I know there's a lot of vendors uh, in that space trying to scale, because I think it's gonna be a very big market. Steven? Are you gonna weigh in on Pareto versus log normal? Yeah. <laughs> I will not. I, I will actually admit, I, I, would, I would have to probably spend a few hours and go read some Wikipedia and Google for the terms and figure out how to do that, because that's not something I've done yet. So, but I do feel confident, you know, I could also just ask Michael for his code, I bet. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's all just stats. So I don't have an opinion one way or the other, because I haven't done any research or background on it. So, but thank you for bringing that up again. <laughs> but what's your favorite algorithm? So that, that's actually, Allison isn't here, but um, I, I mentioned that thing where there's a, a package that I work with, it's called Carrot, it's within the R language, um, and it, it wraps 169 different models, different algorithms. And like I said, the, my most favorite algorithm is the one that works best for the situation. And the thing about algorithms is that they're all tuned based on the data that they were developed with or developed to work with. So you have models that may work better with one data set and then you try to model something else and it'll be a whole different algorithm that you have to work with, right? So the, in my mind, there, isn't a, a, there are some that are really cool conceptually, like the topic of a random forest is really fun to talk about. But when it comes to actually putting it into some kind of model or algorithm, it, it, whatever performs best is the, the one that I like best that day, so. Um, I have a question that might be a couple of years out, but you started off with this, that there are no schools teaching, frankly, either data science, and I guess some are popping up, or cybersecurity. Um, and I guess I would like to get your thoughts on what a good security program would look like that would be a Bachelor of Science in security rather than something else. So like a good undergrad program for security? Yeah, because I think I, this is a negative unemployment industry for bad reasons, not for good ones. Yeah. It's hard because I, and this is all based on opinion, but I, I really appreciate the background that I had growing up where there wasn't information security. It was, you know, I grew up and broke things, and that was how I learned how security worked, you know. And I, I don't think anybody has to break stuff to learn security, but there's something about sort of, coming up through the ranks and running a system, running a network and seeing how they fail. So I think you know, the best way to get into information security is to be a sysadmin, to go through IT and MIS training and to understand routing and all that stuff. And then security is just sort of icing on top. Security is what makes it go wrong and how do you prevent that, right? So I, I know it's not a great answer. and I know that there's probably good programs out there. Um, but yeah, and same thing with statistics. I mean, there, there's probably several good courses. Um, the only problem that I found with statistics and learning statistics is that they're very heavily tied to the tool. So if you go to a school, like the, the tool I used was Minitab, and there are places that still use that in the business, but not many, you know? Um, and so you, you wanna find, that's one of the questions if I were going back to school again, I'd say, what tool are your classes based on? Is it Minitab or SAS or SPSS or R or whatever? So that's a big part of it. So. Anything else? All right, what a way to end this conference. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.